Hi, everybody, friends, all. I have uh, the pleasure of introducing you to day two, which is beginning to scale in the US. And as my introduction, I'm going to pull out my phone because I had to do a little research um, in introducing you to day two. They're in the business of the gut microbiome. And there's a very important noun and thing that you need to have when you're in the gut microbiome business. So I, I've never said this word in public before. Um, it's been in my blog a couple times. So I looked it up, and the noun definition is solid matter discharged from an animal's alimentary canal. And other synonyms are excrement, feces, and BM. But the word that I used to search was poop because in the video introducing me to day two online, I think it was Israeli made, that cute video has kind of a Flintstones-y theme at a dinner table, they use the word poop. So I thought, well, let's set the bar really low for our first CEO discussion. So Josh, welcome nice to time. Health 2.0, yes. Uh, Lehi Siegel, the CEO from Israel, was going to be here, but travel being what it is, we're blessed to have you here. So you're a name that's been involved in digital health for a long time. Could you just give a blast about you first before we dig into the gut microbiome? Sure. I've been in uh, technology for 25 years, uh, the last uh, 15 in healthcare. Um, prior company was Kias, mm -hmm. uh, which did employee engagement and utilization of health benefits for employers and, uh, and been uh, with uh, day two for about uh, three years. That's amazing. Three years already. Yeah. Wow. So tell us about the business of gut microbiome, because I don't want to assume everybody understands it. Sure. So when I first met the founders in Israel, um, their, the way the memory of the meeting was, Lehi said to me, we want you to send us your shit. And uh, yeah, the one, the one word for stool that, uh, that hasn't been brought up. And by the way, if anyone needs stool jokes, we've got a million of them. Um, well, we can't wait. Um, Good for Twitter. What did, what did one fly say to the other? Is this stool taken? Um, so, uh, right. Yeah. Twitter. We'll, we'll be playing Santa Clara all week. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the company was founded out of a clinical trial in Israel at the Weizmann Institute, mm -hmm. which if, for those who haven't been to the Middle East or know or in the sciences, Weizmann is uh, Israel's answer to Bell Labs. Um, or Bell Labs was uh, for life sciences. Pure research, no undergraduates, uh, thousands of doctorates and postdocs doing original research. Mm -hmm. And the scientists started with the question, what is the best diet for humans? Because if we knew what it was, we probably wouldn't have the conditions and the states that we have now with regard to people, food, and metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they embarked on the largest uh, nutrition trial in history which was to understand the impact of food on people. And what they found were two key findings that are the, at the core of, of the service that we offer now. The first key finding was, number one, people respond differently to the same food. Uh, and so that if you eat an apple and I eat an apple, mm -hmm. our glycemic response to that food can be wildly different. Mm. And one of the reasons for that is the composition of our gut microbiome, the bacteria in our gut. And we know now that there are 3,000 species of bacteria, up to that many, in, in people's guts. We know that the signature of that bacteria, which we measure by diversity, how many of the 3,000 are there, and abundance, how much of each species and strain is there, um, varies wildly between people. We also know that people are relatively consistent to themselves. While people are interpersonally different in their gut microbiome signatures, they're, they're relatively consistent to themselves, provided they live in a stable environment. Uh, and so this has been an opportunity, um, the scientists learned who conducted the initial trial, to profile people. They didn't know they would find this when they started. Mm -hmm. They collected 150 measures for patients, everything you could possibly collect, liver panel, lipid panel, glucose panel, a microbiome panel, um, human DNA, uh, every anthropometric you could ask for. Um, and what they learned was that of the 150 measures per patient, um, they then used machine learning tools to build a model and said, of all this data, they also used glucose monitors, food prescriptions, food journaling. 
and then combine all the data to make a model and say what correlates for these people in terms of how they're responding to what foods. And, um, and this is where the initial aha was, uh, uh-oh, what we thought was a common response to food doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. There's a wild uh, variation between food and something called the glycemic index should probably be thrown out the window. And this is the, uh, an empirical uh, first time uh, proof of that by looking at these subjects, tracking them over time with glucose monitors, and giving food prescriptions so that we could actually see the interpersonal variability. The second thing uh, we saw was that, well, I guess the second part of the first thing, that this is not true for one food. This is true for almost every food tested. There are some exceptions, like pure protein and pure fat have a more similar response for people. But anything that has any degree of carbohydrates or glucose mm -hmm. has wild variations with people. Mm -hmm. and, that's, um, and so that's a key finding. The second key finding was the combinations of foods have wildly different reactions for people. Mm -hmm. So if, if you um, spike on an apple and your doctor says, you really should cut back on the high sugar fruits, yes. what we're learning is that you can combine that apple with fats or proteins and tamp down the glycemic response and make it safe to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a, and by the way, full disclosure, we're focused on people with glycemia, people who have type two, people who are pre-diabetic. They're our target customer because they benefit the most from glycemic control. So we can now use gut profiling um, to provide a food as medicine prescription mm -hmm. for patients um, so that they can rapidly come into glycemic control. Mm -hmm. We use A1C and time in range as our measures. Mm -hmm. Time in range from a glucose monitor, if you have one, A1C as the more standard metric that's been collected um, for decades. Yeah. And, and we look at both and, uh, and then bringing that A1C down using food as medicine mm -hmm. is, is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, glycemic index is in so many of the subscription diet plans that we're seeing in mass media now, so no wonder our obesity problem is still our obesity problem, because right. it's, there's now, it's a myth, you're saying. Well, what we saw in the first trial, which was published in the journal Cell, is that um, uh, for about half, over half of the patients who were profiled, right. um, taking even what would be recommended dietary guidelines, mm -hmm. Um, were, they were having glycemic uh, glycemia uh, responses to those meals sure. go, going way above 140. Sure. And, and then what we further have learned is that if you take the guidelines from ADA or from the USDA mm -hmm. and you apply them to um, healthy and pre-diabetic and diabetic folks, mm -hmm. a majority will actually go further into a metabolic state than not, meaning generic guidelines really aren't helpful because right. the, for a majority of patients, they're actually... Uh, detrimental in terms of driving glycemia, which we know drives inflammation, drives weight gain, and ultimately sure. prediabetes and diabetes behaviorally over time. Mm -hmm. And so how can we intercept that using food to have a more profound impact? Because that's the, the biggest, uh, the highest quantity of medication anyone takes. And this whole food as medicine concept, I'm doing more work in the retail health space with groceries and pharmacies. And so we're really seeing that as a growth area because consumers, uh, patients as consumers really want to go to the grocery and understand and make good food decisions, but they're not well armed. So um, this is, I think, a growth area for um, even outside of health care in that retail health environment that's mor morphing into health care, right? That's right. There is, um, we've, we've been approached by every grocer and large retailer. Um, we're focused on, on providers, employers, and payers. Yeah. But when you get into the large-scale retail, pharmacy, grocery, um, and, uh, and shopping, consumer shopping, mm -hmm. anyone that has a pharmacy chain is now uh, saying to us, well, if they're getting, if they're getting their meds right. here, and they're also picking up groceries here, yeah. and we know that half of their groceries are sending them further into a glycemic state mm -hmm. uh, that they shouldn't be in, mm -hmm. why don't we get them profiled at the point of sale of the medication mm -hmm and then have them purchase the groceries that would actually help them um, have a food uh, regimen that would work for them. Right. Now, I also point out that we think this means the, the end of, the, glycemic, the, the era of the glycemic index is over if we actually then know that the glycemic index is so vast for any food, you could drive a Mack truck through it. Yeah. The other thing we know that um, the era of low carb we think is coming to an end because what we're the, this is the, perhaps the third finding of the initial study that we've now proven out in two more studies, is that carbs aren't the enemy. Carbs um, are highly personalized. Mm -hmm. And so to say to a uh, patient with diabetes or prediabetes, you need to be carb restricted or eliminate these carbs, is not only faulty, it's unhealthy, mm -hmm. 
uh, it's also not easy to adhere to. Our average food prescriptions have 30% carbohydrates in the diet that they are prescribed from a clinician, mm -hmm. but the carbs between people are different. Mm -hmm. So you might be uh, offered, uh, for, based on your gut profile, right. bread is okay to come back in, mm -hmm. but not rice. For others, some, they may be offered rice, but not bread, and for others, it could be both in moderation. And for others, there still are some people who may not have either, mm -hmm. but could do those isolated ingredients in combination with other things to bring the glycemic response into range. Mm -hmm. So the, the ability to reintroduce carbohydrates to people who've been told that they're the enemy is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. The ability to um, give someone an adherable protocol, an adherable care plan with food, mm -hmm. because we believe that ketogenic, unless you're an Olympian yeah. or unusual in another way, most people can't do keto. Mm -hmm. Endocrinologists tell us 5% of their patient population can. Mm -hmm. So, and we believe that that's wow. basically true because most people have some need for carbs at some point and it's not a natural state to have no carb or highly restricted. Mm -hmm. So then how do we look at that fact and also look at the fact that um, people, it's hard to adhere to restrictive protocols mm -hmm. and say, can we meet people where they are, but profile them to give them carbohydrates that work for them and don't spike their blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. Got it. So that's a lot on the science, which we were going to talk about later, but you got a lot of, a lot of that up front. So let's talk about the business. Sure. So uh, that's obviously evidence-based stuff out of Weitzman, and there's a whole other conversation we could have about how this little country, Israel, with this little footprint, is spawning so much digital health innovation. Uh, it must be in the, you know, the seawater, I don't know. But um, there, it's a phenomenon, really, um, separate from, from that conversation. What is the, this business? How do you deploy this solution um, to those channels, which we'll talk about after? But what's the thing? Sure. So, um, so to take a, a quarter step back, to go two steps forward. Yep. When we started to bring the business to the US uh, a couple of years ago, the first reaction we had was from the clinical community, this is Israeli-based science. Israel's great, and it's not American patients, American gut, right. American Amer food. Mediterranean diet, right. blah, blah, blah. So, so then we went to the Mayo Clinic, yeah. and we had them validate the science mm -hmm. and publish that in JAMA this year. Mm -hmm. So we had to go to Mayo to get an American reference validation clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And now we're at the Jocelyn in Boston right. having them do our uh, type two work so that American clinicians can see that this is not an Israeli exception. Mm -hmm. um, and we're there now, so that, that's good. The, that was key to getting into the market. And now that we're in the market, what we're focused on are those um, sponsors of healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, employers particularly, mm -hmm. uh, and payers where they bear the risk mm -hmm. uh, for patients with prediabetes and diabetes they have a financial incentive to control right. the risk and the cost, mm -hmm. and we can now offer them a fees at risk solution to do that using food as medicine. Mm -hmm. And what is the solution then? So the solution uh, requires uh, uh, a gut microbiome profile. So mm -hmm. get a poop in a box. In a box. It's, as we like to say, it's like Cologuard for diabetes. Poop in a box, send us the sample, our lab processes it. Mm -hmm. Results are returned typically to the clinician the clinician will have a consultation with the patient to say, here's your gut results. And based on those results, let's now build a uh, food profile for you that is non-spiking, mm -hmm. that keeps you in that 80 to 120 range of mm -hmm. blood glucose. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's ongoing, um, and then we arm the provider with a toolkit to then follow up with the patients, because we believe the providers are crucial to on long-term success, that you don't just throw an app at someone and expect it to work. And we also believe that dieting is faulty because it typically is a short-term five-month uh, protocol in the history of America that has massive yo-yo uh, uh, zigzags between adherence and adherence. So we're really taking this uh, in what's known as medical nutrition therapy. Mm -hmm. This should come through a clinician. This should be part of a care plan. This should be integrated with the, uh, the, uh, the prescriptions that they're taking and the rest of the care plan that they're under. And it should be under the guidance of a clinician so that we can bring uh, their patients more rapidly into glycemic control um, in the context of a broader care plan. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we give an app to the patient that they can actually build meals, check foods before they eat, um, and they, we give a tool set to the provider or their, um, or their staff based on who's doing the work at the, at the provider level, mm -hmm. so they can actually create a meal plan for the patient that's tuned to them, mm -hmm. starting with what they already do. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we've learned that if you were profiled and your results came in and I were your doctor, I would say, okay, we got your results. 
Um, and as part of the pre-work, you would have provided what you normally eat. Sure. And we would compare what you normally eat to your glycemic responses of those foods, and you'd be surprised how many things you think are healthy that you eat oh, that I spike bet. you. So, I bet. so we know that, for example, vegetable salad that's high in cucumbers spikes a lot of people. Yeah. We know that ginger, in my case, spikes me. Really? And we know that oats also spikes me, but with walnuts does not. So there's ways for me to bring oats back into my diet. Um, now, we also know that we don't want to tell someone, go eat these other things you never ate before. So the behavioral, you, starting with Prochaska's model, yes. how do we make tiny changes and meet them where they are? Mm -hmm. And how do we uh, inventory, as part of the pre-work, what you're already eating? Get the scores for that, mm -hmm. what the glycemic response would be, and then tune those meals ever so slightly mm -hmm. to have the patient leave the consultation with the clinician, saying, I can basically do what I was doing mm -hmm but make tiny changes to each meal, whether it's in combination of ingredients or a slight modification of portion to bring me below 140. Right. And that is a big victory because the, the, the joy to a person who has diabetes mm -hmm. being told they can have carbohydrates again oh, is unbelievable. I, I'm sure that's true. So just a couple nuggets in there to put in your um, parking lot to follow up. Prochaska's model of behavior change, very important. I went to public health school, learned it there. Uh, so, so learn about that after we're done. Um, and then that little BJ Fogg kind of moment where small changes day by day make a big difference uh, when you're armed with really good information. So um, a couple of, of thoughts came to my mind. This is B to B to C. So the, B, the first B is you'll channel through employers, self-insureds, maybe some value-based health plans who we saw this morning perhaps, uh, like an Oscar or, or someone like that. And then the second B, though, is the clinician who has to do shared decision making, uh, um, communication, participatory health with the patient, the C. So that middle B, um, how do you educate the clinician, health coach, maybe they have a diabetes educator on sure. staff, but that is a, a place where this could fall apart. Sure, so one of the uh, learnings for me um, in the diabetes space is there's 15,000 people in America with the title CDE, or Certified Diabetes Educator. Mm -hmm. These are typically um, dietitians or pharmacists or nurses, any one of those three uh, job functions, who in addition have received uh, 2,000 hours of clinical time with people with diabetes only. And that allows them to then better serve those people. And they tend to be the, the extender for the doc or the clinician who's working with a diabetic a population of people with diabetes. Uh, these, these clinicians um, are very data-driven and education-based because they're, they're educating their patients. That, that's their job is yeah. just to educate the patient, yeah. not necessarily to treat the patient. That's the doctor. Sure. This is someone who comes in behind the doc and says, now let's work on how you uh, take that information and use it mm -hmm. and apply it. And so... Um, we've, we've taken the science that came out of Mayo and came out of the Weitzman, and we've made it uh, continuing medical education for uh, endocrinologists, mm -hmm. for MDs, family docs, and for CDEs. Yes. And we end up going around the country now with our team of clinicians Great. giving medical education to the front line mm -hmm. so that they can take that back. They, first of all, they get to maintain their license using the credits sure. from our science uh, education. Mm -hmm because it's uh, now accredited in all of the major bodies uh, as something that docs, clinicians, dietitians, nurses, uh, endos should know as part of licensure. Mm -hmm. But they can then take that back to their clinic and say, now that I've been trained through medical education, right. I can now know how to better implement this as a clinician. Mm -hmm. And then we offer ongoing support for clinicians at no charge just because they are the hands and feet they are the evangelical force for helping get food as medicine to the front line. And then from a consumer patient point of view, when a consumer or patient is prescribed something, whether it's an app or a tool like this, they're more likely to adhere than if they just hear it from a friend or a family member. So I think that's very powerful coming from the clinician's mouth or the extender's mouth. We only have a minute left. How did that happen? So very quickly, um, what's the plan in 30 seconds to uh, grow this in the United States? So we are now engaged with uh, dozens of employers mm -hmm. and payers uh, bringing the solution to market with, for people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, uh, through our FDA trial uh, with Jocelyn, we, yes. we look to uh, raise the standard of care 
uh, to not only reference our science, which it does today, but to actually include gut microbiome profiling as part as a necessity of uh, profiling a person with glycemia so that they can be better brought into control more quickly using food as medicine. I love it. Well, I know you're not um, B to C yet, but I want to poop in a box and share it because I, I, I go to Italy a lot and I don't gain weight on pasta in Italy. This is a true story. It's probably because like olive oil. And here, that's well, it's a little Mediterranean thing, right? And here, forget it. Right. Like, no pasta in the U.S. So I, I need you to do the B2C thing, or maybe as a favor you might. All right, so full disclosure, we have an offering for B2C. We just don't talk about it, but since we're hey. here... Um, if you go I'm to day2.com uh, and you uh, Honey, get, get profiled, I'm so excited. we can get you profiled. I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.